then my fraternity would be the proverbial carrying coal to newcastle but even so we have many youngsters who have joined the group and uh, to them i must say uh, that dr lingam gopal as a human being far supersedes dr lingam gopal as a vitreoretinal surgeon if we juxtapose dr lingam gopal a human being he is humble he is humility and humble to a fault virtually uh, he answers the silliest question from anybody and you know he has been such a wide eyed student of ophthalmology all along that his ophthalmic brilliance pales to uh, insignificance uh, to talk about his ophthalmic brilliance he is a skillful surgeon an astute clinician uh, with an encyclopedic scholarship in his chosen domain he has been a mentor to all of us uh, and uh, i have great pleasure in welcoming you sir to talk about uh, a, a very very important aspect about mental health as far as uh, vitreoretinal surgeons are concerned dr lingam gopal please share the screen first are my slides visible yes sir yeah <clears throat> at the outset i would like to thank again dr mahesh for even considering this concept of uh, well being of vitreoretinal surgeon as an important seminar subject and i would like to thank uh, my dear friend dr kumar for that wonderful introduction which my mother will be very proud of uh, the topic given to me is a mental well being of vitreoretinal surgeon clinician's perspective in the context i'm sorry it's not context but context of a vr surgeon mental wellness can perhaps be defined as a state of mental equilibrium that permits optimal care to the patient so the factors that can influence the mental wellness are can be work related personal issues but both can affect the functioning of the vr surgeon in terms of delivery of optimal care to the patient as we take our problems at home to work and backwards too so burnout refers to a uh, a syndrome of depersonalization emotional exhaustion and feeling of reduced achievement in fact there are studies which have shown that it is believed to affect almost 40% of surgeons and is associated with both direct adverse clinical outcomes and increased attrition from training programs the risk factors for this burnout phenomena are of course workload which is very important and some power some studies have shown that private practitioners are more prone for this burnout compared to those in academic settings i'm not sure what the cause is is it because they don't have as much uh, interaction with other uh, the fellow uh, doctors etc and also there are some people who have the inability to cope with the patient suffering that affects them personally very badly the others i won't uh, talk too much about the debt load legal issues lack of administrative support and one important point i want to make mention again this is from studies published data that lady surgeons seem to be more prone for burnout phenomena than male surgeons maybe because they have to deal with uh, home as well as work uh, much more vigorously than the men tend to uh, bestow their attention on their family life so the adverse effect of burnout is there are increased medical errors which is perhaps bad because that can affect your practice and your uh, patient care absenteeism can occur and in extreme case of course you can go to depression and suicide and depersonalization so three terms which we deal with are sympathy empathy and compassion if we go through the dictionary sympathy says you understand the problem empathy says you understand and also feel for the patient well compassion takes it a step beyond that is you understand you feel for the patient and also act upon it so is it that it is a step wise increase in your involvement from understanding to feeling for the patient and act on it not necessarily it's a two way phenomena when you feel the, for the patient you understand more about his or her problem and try to do even better and when you act on it and see the outcome it again makes you understand the disease better and manage it better and also feel for the patient because you're interacting with the patient so these are all two way phenomena not one way phenomena so what happens is when you understand but you don't feel for the patient but you act on it you become more impersonal more robotic 
your treatment may be efficacious in terms of getting the final uh, anatomical and uh, visual outcome, but perhaps the satisfaction to the patient is not great because he doesn't seem to see you as a human being, see you more as a robot administering the treatment. So if the treatment outcome is bad, then there can be repercussions. The patient will, will attribute everything to your lack of personal involvement. While if the, if the outcome is good, probably you won't complain. Suppose your understanding is bad, but you feel really for the patient and act on it. The treatment will be ineffective because you don't understand the disease, not the treatment protocols well. And it may be, uh, in fact, you may do unacceptable things because you want to do something for the patient, but you don't know what to do. And this can actually result in sometimes bad outcomes because you are doing things which are not meant for the particular disease process. But what happens very often in, in beginners is that the feeling for the patient is getting exaggerated out of proportion. And at the same time, their understanding is still not as great as a for an experienced surgeon. But they want to act on it, obviously, because they're the treat, they treating the patient. So this is very typical of beginner surgeons. They're shell-shocked. If there's a complication or an adverse outcome, they're shell-shocked. They're unable to act appropriately. And in fact, they can go through a phase of denial of facts. This happens very often in uh, initial cataract surgeons. When suppose they have a hypopia. They don't want to accept that it can be endophthalmitis and act upon it appropriately. They're so shocked with that, which has happened to their patient that they don't want to accept that it can be endophthalmitis. They treat the patient with just topical drops and let things happen. And then of course it becomes too late. So this is not something which we want them to go through. So what they, they should do is of course improve upon it, but we'll come to that a little later. You can feel for the patient you can understand very well once you're experienced a little bit in the mid phase of your career, you understand the disease better, you're able to manage very well, but still there are a few people who feel for the patient in a more exaggerated fashion than they should. And this becomes too much exaggerated if they're affected severely by the bad outcomes. And what can, what can happen is, I'm not saying that you should not be sympathetic to the patient, but I'm only saying that your reaction should be not out of proportion to what has happened. When that happens, it can potentially affect your functioning at optimum levels and hence the delivery of treatment to the subsequent patient as well. So this is where you need to control your emotions. So ideally, it should be a balance, a balance of understanding, balance of feeling for the patient and acting on it. Then you're able to deliver the best treatment. An adverse outcome can happen despite your best efforts. And that should trigger the positive features, not negative features. The positive features are you review the case and attempt to tweak and improve upon the processes. And that should actually give you better outcomes for the future, if not for this case. It's called grit and perseverance. And many studies have shown that people with grit and perseverance have the best achievement and outcome in the long run. So what are the protective factors against this burnout phenomenon? One is of course a good work environment. If you're not happy with the place you're working, the colleagues with whom you're working, maybe it's better to change the environment. Sharing thoughts, this I thought is a very, very important thing. If you keep the failure within yourself or the adverse outcome within yourself, it really eats up into your brain and then makes you feel more and more depressed. So best is to share your success and failure with your peers and colleagues. Similarly, listen to stories from them. Literally having a shoulder to carry on, that really takes away some of the uh, severity of the damage it can cause to your emotional well-being. Taking a more philosophical approach while dealing with cases with poor prognosis and adverse outcome. It's easier said than done, but with experience you realize that you can handle these emotions reasonably well. Other protective factors are meditation, family holidays at regular intervals, attempting to learn something new over a period of time, 50 years and beyond. You get into a routine of your life and then that can really uh, have an adverse effect on your emotional outcome when you consistently operate on bad prognosis cases. So that's where you try to learn something new or different. I try to learn something in between at the age of 55. I try to learn epidemiology and biostatistics. It really helped me a lot because it exercises your brain, it stimulates your mind. And understand also that one cannot satisfy everyone. And keep a mirror to yourself in an objective manner. Don't uh, sort of... Uh, uh, accuse yourself of, of not doing enough. So when there's a difficult case and outcome, 
you sort of itemize what all went wrong, which is very important because you want to make things better for your next case and subsequently. But also itemize what went right because that's something you should strengthen. And don't blame yourself for what is clearly out of your control and ask yourself, have I done my best? All these are important because that's what makes you better for the subsequent cases. And let each difficult case be a harbinger of improvisations. That's what I said, grit and perseverance. Emotions should be kept under check. I'm not saying there are, you cannot have emotions because then you become a robo. You should have emotions, but they should be kept under check. And they should not overwhelm you and not allow you to improve yourself in subsequent cases. Then if in the, in the worst case, when you had a really, really bad case or bad day, try to do something different on that day. Listen to good music, go to a movie, go to your best friend and spend time, etc. So that you come out of that very quickly. So the next day, there's no carryover effect. So when you deal with desperate patients and parents and grandparents who accompany patients with ROP stage five, for example, one must become a little bit of a pachyderm. Pachyderm, I mean thick skin. You are sympathetic, you are compassionate, but you should not allow that to overwhelm you emotionally. Develop the art of resetting your emotimeter to zero before you start the next patient. Otherwise there's a carryover effect and that can affect your management of subsequent patients. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you very much, sir, for that excellent and uh, erudite presentation. In fact, this whole uh, discourse is based on the premise of uh, physician heal thyself or cura tipsum, as the Latin expression goes, that we need to be at our optimum to be giving the best to our patients. Although, sir, you covered it broadly, uh, I would like you to dwell on this dichotomy of sorts that often confronts a vitreoretinal surgeon, particularly the beginners. Uh, if if we are not able to perform uh, surgery to the optimum in a given case, we may take it with a, a pinch of salt and with a, in a philosophical way when we may not be learning much. We may just say that the disease was too overwhelming and therefore it's the patient hard luck and we leave it there. So that may, may lead the vitreoretinal surgeon not to indulge in any introspection or learning. On the other hand, if he becomes overly critical about himself self-deprecating uh, himself for all the wrongs that went wrong, he may develop anxiety, depression, and stuff like that. So when we are faced with such a kind of a dichotomy, uh, how do we really balance? Because that is the key to uh, carrying on. I think the, the key is to be as objective as you can be. And it's possibly not, it is probably not possible on the same day that you had the event, but maybe the next day you can sit with your colleague. That's what I said, it's important to have somebody whom you can depend upon, whom you respect their opinion, sit with them and list out all the things that went wrong in the case. And also, as I said, list out all the things that went right. And subsequently, you try to see what you can tweak to make your surgery better, your approach to the treatment better. And also, there's nothing wrong in, in digging through the literature and see what others have done in the same situation, so that you know where probably there's a lacuna in your knowledge, fill it up now. Because no human being is born perfect. And we have to make ourselves as perfect as we can with each case. So every case feeds some information, positive or negative. And even if you are not treating, if somebody else is treating or you're observing, even from that you can learn. So all this learning process helps, you know, helps us to sort of improve our positive points and reduce our negative points. And that's how you try to give the best to the uh, best treatment to the patient. I don't think uh, anybody can say that I have done my best uh, at any given point of time and say, this is the best that can be done. But yes, probably even better can be done, but that is something you need to uh, evaluate at the end of each case. Uh, two, two other issues that I would like to discuss with you, sir. Uh, you know, there might always be a feeling that a senior surgeon, however experienced the surgeon may be, someone better than him could have handled this better. So that kind of a feeling may always uh, swamp the mind of a vitreoretinal surgeon sometimes. The second thing is many times we have to throw in the towel and abandon a given case. Then also a sense of guilt may overwhelm us. So these two specific situations uh, I'd like you to throw light on. No, there is no doubt that a more experienced surgeon can probably do things a little better. But there's always a gray area where, where there are some cases where you know nobody would have helped this, help this guy irrespective of who is operating. But there are some group of cases where you, you may believe that somebody else may have done a better job. If you had an opportunity to get such a help, by all means, get the help. If it is in this, within the same institute, 
If you are stuck with a situation where you are not able to solve, call your senior and ask them to help you out. No pride is involved there. You are only trying to help the patient do his best. So there you should take help. But if you are not able to take help on the table because it's impracticable, and if it is still possible to take an opinion from the person afterwards, send the patient over to somebody like Dr. Mahesh Shanmugam and ask for help. Can you do you think you can do one more surgery and rectify this problem? But so this is where I think people should have to swallow their pride and try to do the best for the patient. But there are always, a, as you gain experience, you realize that, okay, this particular case, I don't think anybody would have helped. Then that is where I think you need to accept that that is a human limitation. And then say that, okay, I've done my best. Thank you very much, sir. Are there any other points of view from the other panelists or any queries to Dr. Gopal, please? Dr. Natarajan? Yeah, sir, Kumar, thank you. Thank you, Gopal, for a wonderful talk. So you were mentioning about sharing bad experience or good experience with the colleagues. I, I'm sure you remember when I was a fellow and Dr. Chief was starting the VR with all of us, we had a eight to nine daily meeting, grilling each other what happened the day before and what is the plan of action and then including coming late about 8 to 8.30 every day we had. I think that really helped. And I remember one day, I think the giant air 6-9 with the MacLaurin patients come and we used to do that upside down surgery with the GA by Dr. Ayans and the Raj. And finally, I remember all the nine patients that we had only PL post-surgery because of the PVR. And he told, I'm not going to operate any giant air. And I, I remember we both were doing it for, for some time because I think uh, any surgeon, even a, a person like she was the best we are surgeon, all of us know, and that was in 85, 86. So I think anybody will have fatigue, anybody will have upset, but I think the best was to share, saying that I can't do, and then give it to somebody. And he always asked, okay, can you do? And he used to share with uh, Gopal, me, and Dr. C at that time, and also Arun Allen as a fellow. I think we have to share, and I even now, I think now and then I call Gopal or uh, Mahesh or even some uh, we have surgeons, my friends in the US, to share the experience because sometimes the trauma patients are terrible, the expectations are terrible. So I think you have to promise less and deliver more. Thank you, Dr. Natarajan. I think Tarubaleri has a question uh, how to set your emotimeter to zero uh, in between cases. Uh, Dr. Gopal, would you please? No, how? I don't know. <laughs> it is <laughs> probably. It is just your own. Uh, I mean, if nobody can set it to zero. But as as much towards zero as possible, so that most important thing is it should not affect the rest of the day for you. And Great. I can share with you one one story, which is a real story of a person who was operating in a relatively small town where there are no other doctors available except that particular surgeon. And he was operating, and then when he opened the abdomen, something happened. I don't know what exactly was a story, but he got so upset he left the patient on the table and walked away never to return, he committed, went and committed suicide, that, that surgeon. And the patient's abdomen was open. And the, the relatives had to take the patient with the abdomen open, covered with gauze pieces and all, to the nearest town uh, while the patient was under uh, sedation and try to repair the abdominal wound. So that is, that is an extreme where the motivator could not be brought down at all. What I'm trying to say is, to the extent human beings can set their emotimeter to zero, please do that so that you don't have a carryover effect for you know, the rest of the day. Yes, sir. Yeah, it, it's also, just like uh, trying to stay in the moment, as they say. And if you have to draw an analogy from the game of cricket, if a batsman is badly beaten by a previous delivery, you should not be dwelling on that. Otherwise, he may get out the next ball. You should forget about it and concentrate on the next ball, absolutely. something similar. And uh, to deal with it, to discuss the issue of sharing, many times that helps in many ways. There is a Persian proverb that goes this way that I was cursing that I had no pair of shoes till I saw a person who had no feet. You know, whereas, you know and a more experienced person may have, may have experienced greater difficulties. When you come to know about that, you tend to feel a lot better. Uh, I think uh, in the interest of time, Dr. Mahesh, should we move on? Or are there any other points of discussion? Yeah, sure, sure, Dr. Kumar. I think Dr. Natarajan wanted to make a comment and last comment and then we can go on to the next one. I think I agree. One is, uh, I think uh, we, can, we should go for counseling. There's no, there's no problem of uh, like feeling that you're low and you can't, if you can't do immediately between cases, as Dr. Kumar said, like this is an extreme case. I think if you're constantly in touch with uh, somebody, like I could not manage uh, my when my grandmother passed away and it was terrible. So I went and did a course on 
I was a cognitive scientist for 90 hours. That means I paid for it, but it's worth it. Either you go to a counselor or go to somebody like that or do an exercise or yoga or something as Dr. Gopal said, even music, but you have to identify that you have a problem and that is a, it's a mental issue. It's not a mental problem, but I think uh, you have to be mentally strong. So one is a uh, prayer and the prayer with faith. And the second is uh, go for counseling, uh, whatever type of counseling it will be. I think that will help because everybody will face this problem, uh, particularly if you're only doing VR surgery. So uh, no case will be the same every day. And then you may think the simple case and you'll go for terrible from a, a six nine to PL and they will keep on on to you. And it, I face it even today. But I, I think you have to learn to, uh, instead of living with it, that's the wrong term. You have to find how to cope up with it. That's why I said you, to, you should not react. You should actually respond. And that's a management uh, issue also. Any problem comes, everybody reacts. And that's where I think we get angry and we shout all that. So I think the best is to uh, respond. So for example, some patient is shouting outside. When the patient comes, I one thing I do, I don't even ask what for what is the problem. I just start him. What is their eye problem? So he immediately forgets everything. So I think the, you have to find a way how to tackle it. Yeah, there are many ways to skin a cat, and we must try and figure out each 